Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host here, I'm Simon, and what happens is Katie, our excellent writer for this channel, uh, slash podcast, has written me a script, The Georgia Guidestones, Tips for a Post-Apocalyptic World. These are like these monolithic stones that were put up in, I'm gonna guess, Georgia, and not Georgia like near Russia, Georgia, but Georgia like, uh, Atlanta. Georgia. Um, and they were weird and no one really knows what they're about. I am assuming because people do that people think they were put there by aliens. They probably weren't. Let's just jump in. Uh, I'm going to read what Katie's written. I'm going to add some thoughts if I have any. I usually do. People sometimes complain about them. Sometimes they say, oh, it's nice when you add your own thoughts. Fact, boy. We love that. We love that about you. Anyway, let's just jump in. We're all familiar with the concept of some sort of apocalypse happening. In recent, I mean, I hope not literally. In recent pop culture, there have been many, many zombie apocalypses, and humanity has always seemed to make it through at the other end. Wait, <laughs> that's not what happens in zombie movies. You know, in zombie movies, there's always like almost everyone is destroyed by zombies, and then there's like a ragtag group of survivors. But the reality is, like, 99% of humanity has been destroyed by zombies, and the, you know. So will probably the rest. Best case scenario, they reach some safe haven that they've heard about over a radio. They go there and uh, they live out their days in a compound. And that's where it ends, with 99% of humanity dead. <laughs> that's the reality of zombie movies. Not wanting to jinx anything, we've also had very recent run-ins with highly contagious diseases. But again, so far the majority of the population has survived. But what would happen if there was an event so monumental and civilization as we know it took such a hit that the very foundations of our society would have to be rebuilt almost from scratch? I mean, like, okay. Let's try and do it better this time around, shall we? Because there's a whole lot of fucked up stuff that I don't like. I don't think most people like. Let's just try and do a better job, you know? It's like a blank canvas to paint a better society on. Would you know what to do if this happens? Would anyone? I actually got a book for Christmas last year. It's called How to Invent Everything. And it's a book about that basically, you know, is like, uh, explains the most basic stuff because most people, you know, there's the example i think it's given in this book or maybe this is just another example of like no one knows how to make a pencil like the reality is like the wood is harvested by one company then it's made into like little long things by another company and other companies working on graphite and the reality is that no one person knows how to make a pencil which is kind of a problem and this book explains how you could make a simple pencil fascinating tangent simon thank you for that well luckily there are a set of granite stones in a field in elberton georgia in the usa that have all the tips you need for how to start rebuilding a society following an apocalyptic event wait what yeah i mean how much information are you gonna get on these stones this book is relatively thin and i'm like yeah i know it's it's mostly like for fun but I, it's not going to be a super useful actual guide for the end of the world the mystery Elberton, Georgia is known as the granite capital of the world. This is because there's tons and tons of granite. Shocking news there, but also because the granite found there is finer grains and higher quality than the crappy old granite found anywhere else. So if you're looking to build a monument of something that will last, Elberton might be the place to go. You're welcome, Elberton. Next time you can sponsor this show for all the people looking for high quality granite. In 1979, none other than the president of the Elberton Granite Finishing Corporation himself, Joe H. Fendley Sr was contacted by a mysterious stranger. This stranger was a well-put-together man who said that he represented a group of fellow Americans, all of whom wished to remain anonymous. This group wanted to leave an enduring message for future generations and wanted Elberton both as the source of granite for the project and to act as the actual site for the monument. I mean, it makes sense, because otherwise you got to ship those granite, big granite stones somewhere, which I'm sure is expensive. Sensing a potential matter in the immediate proximity, Fenley gave a ridiculous high quote for the project, assuming that that would end the matter. Yeah, I've definitely done that at points where it's like, I really don't want to work with you, but I can't think of a reason. So just quoting like absolutely massive prices and then people are like, oh, okay, thanks. No longer interested. And it's like, yeah, you and me both. The stranger surprised him by agreeing to the amount, and Fendley's colleague, Wyatt Martin, ended up being nominated as the intermediary agent between this anonymous group and the people actually constructing the piece for them. Yeah, one time, the, there's one time this really happened to me, and I quoted like a ridiculously high number, like, you know, just a go-away number. And then they came back with quite a, quite a ridiculously high number as well, and then I was like, I really don't, I, but I still don't want to work with you, so hard pass. 
The stranger gave his name as R.C. Christian at the time, which was a pseudonym, and even if Wyatt Martin did ever know his real name or who he was, he has publicly sworn that he would never divulge it, even under pain of death. Whoa. <laughs> I'll be like, yeah, 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 but really, if you were going to kill me, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, it was John. It was John the granite slab guy. You wanted to build these granite slabs. It's not that big of a secret. After handing over a scale model and finalizing the details of the monument, R.C. Christian swept out of town, never to be seen again. By the following year, the monument was ready to be unveiled, and on the 22nd of March, 1980. Oh, for some reason I thought this was much more recently. The public got their first official view of the mysterious project. Here's what they saw. Four large rectangular granite slabs were angled around a narrower central granite column. The central column had a slit like a letterbox carved into it through which a small round hole could be seen. And I'm sure if you're just listening to this show right now, you're enjoying this picture that Katie is painting with your mind, you know, because this show is a podcast, but it's also a YouTube channel. And if you're watching the YouTube channel right now, you're probably getting some glorious images of this, which do a better job than the picture in your mind. I mean, not always. Sometimes the picture in your mind is better, but considering this is a factual thing, um, the, the picture on the screen, if you're watching, is, is more accurate. A rectangular capstone sat on top of all five upright pieces. A little way off from the monument was another granite slab set into the ground. So, what was the big deal? It just sounds like a bunch of old granite. Well, the group behind the stones wanted them to function not only as guidelines for future generations, but also as a calendar and a clock. There were inscriptions all over the slabs, sandblasted in letters 4 inches, 10 centimeters high. Those are big letters. You're not going to be able to fit much, even on these giant granite stones. The capstone was inscribed with the same message in four ancient languages, one on each side. The four main stones carried inscriptions on both sides. The same message is repeated in eight different languages. And what do these meticulously inscribed letters say? Around each edge of the capstone is a message in Babylonian cuneiform, classical Greek, Sanskrit, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. The message translates to, Let these be guide stones to an age of reason. Pretty grandiose. And the messages on the four main stones were a set of ten. I hesitate to call them rules. Let's call them guidelines in English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. This is something that's going to really confuse future archaeologists in like a thousand years. They'll be like, wait. Why is there ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics in North America? That doesn't make any sense. Although, I assume by the future they've got way better like archaeological techniques, and they're like, yeah, no, 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 archaeology really got a bit, it got a bit pointless when we invented this device which can just look into the past. Anyway, these guidelines are inscribed as follows: maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Wait, like a population under 500 million? That's going to be really difficult because you're eventually going to get to 500 million and someone's going to be like, oh, don't forget that granite stone said no more people. So we have to wait for people to die now. People are going to be like, uh, dude, seems like there's plenty of space. So f that. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Uh-oh. <laughs> wait, that sounds a little bit like, oh God, I've forgotten the word. A eugenics. That sounds a little bit like eugenics. Don't say eugenics so positively. <laughs> that sounds like eugenics. I meant that sounds like eugenics. Unite humanity with a living new language. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Uh, balance personal rights with social duties. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. All right. I mean, this all feels a bit, I don't know. I don't want to see cl say cliche because they are like, you know, okay, great. But it is a bit like dreamy, isn't it? Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Yeah, I mean, we tried that, didn't we? With the like League of Nations in the 1920s. Then we had World War II. It didn't work brilliantly. It's just saying a lot, but not doing a lot, isn't it? Not to worry, we should be coming back to these later. The granite slab set into the ground is a useful explanation tablet, giving the date the stones were erected and a guide to the languages used. It also explains the astronomical uses for the guide stones, saying that the oblique cut hole in the central column 
indicates celestial pole, which appears to mean that you can always see the North Star through it. Okay. This is one of those things where it's like, this is just going to confuse future people because they're like, these messages on here, but then why are they lining it up with the stars? That feels like very 3,000 years before this was made. So it feels like Stonehenge era rather than like modern era. The letterbox like slot is for tracking the sun and the movement is oriented so the sun will shine through a slit in the capstone at noon each day. From above, the guide stones are set in an X shape, apparently following the annual journey of the moon. It also handily gives the physical data for the monument so no one had to bother getting their measuring sticks out to know the overall height is 19 feet 3 inches, that's 5.87 meters. The total weight is 237,746 pounds, that's 107,000 kilograms. God damn, this is big and heavy. And that the whole thing is made up of 951 cubic feet, uh, 26.9 20, cubic meters of granite. This thing is massive. I saw pictures of this thing, and uh, I didn't quite get a uh, 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 feel for the, the true scope of it. The weight of each of the big slabs is over 20 tons. There are also other measurements, but I couldn't be bothered converting all those numbers, and you can easily look it up for yourself. Yes, agreed, Katie. It's also not that interesting, so I'll happily just move on. The tablet only gave the imperial measurements, by the way, not the metric ones, because as we all know, we're making something for the long distant future, and imperial measurements make a lot of sense, said no one ever. Also, the tablet had an inscription relating to a time capsule buried six feet below, but the parts showing when it was buried and when it should be dug up are blank, so maybe they didn't get around to doing it. Or maybe it was someone in the group's idea, but other people thought it was a bit lame to welcome civilization back with a copy of the Daily Elberton Rag, a scrambled up Rubik's Cube, and a cassette tape of My Sharona. Yes, and none of that stuff. This thing is clearly made of granite and built to last like thousands of years. All of that stuff will have decayed a really long time ago. I made a fascinating video about like there's a time capsule like beneath some university somewhere where it's a big room full of stuff and to stop it all to de- de- like um God, what's wrong with my brain today it's the end of a long day and i didn't sleep very much last night uh it's filled like with inert gas so uh, the stuff doesn't degrade over time i think like they sealed it up and they pumped it full of nitrogen or something and that's pretty cool. It's designed to last for like a thousand years or 70,000 years or something crazy. The other inscription on this highly detailed explanatory tablet states that the sponsors are a small group of Americans who seek the age of reason. That sounds a lot like you're hoping for the end of the world there, doesn't it, mate? And the author is engraved as R.C. Christian and underneath in brackets, a pseudonym. Yes, agonizingly, on a permanent memorial to the rebuilding of humankind, there is a spelling mistake. Oh no! It says pseudonym! I didn't even, I just read it as pseudonym. But they spelt it wrong. Oh my god. How did no one making this giant granite thing realize that that should be an M, not an N? Oh my. According to the specifications set by the mysterious R.C. Christian, the monument was to be in a remotish area, not near any touristy sites. He wanted it to be left in a natural state and accessible to all, so no fences or historic site paraphernalia were to be put up around it. From the moment it was unveiled, people started having opinions about it, with local priests declaring it a symbol of the occult. Alright guys, chill out. It's not that. And others wondering if there were hidden meanings behind the messages. Again, no. It's like this group of people were just like, we'd like to leave a nice little message. A nice little slightly cliched message for future generations after there's been some apocalyptic event. There's no... It's not cursed. (laughs) It's not mysterious. It's just a giant block of granite that someone carved some shit into. So, in the decades since they were erected, have we found out any more about these mysterious stones that have been referred to as America's Stonehenge? Could the inscriptions maybe hold hidden, darker meanings? Why did the anonymous group think these guidelines would even be necessary? Is there devilry afoot? Let's find out. Uh, it's just like, it's some weird club and they were like, let's build a weird thing, shall we? Probably some dudes who have too much money because they bought like 100,000 kilograms of granite. And I know granite's expensive. Like, I don't have a granite countertop in my kitchen because I was like, well, one, I'm definitely going to have to, I'm definitely going to break it at some point. I've already broken the one I have there now. And I'm sure it's going to be super, ex- it is super expensive and it's hard to fix. So I got some like artificial granite thing where you can actually fix it, which is useful because I've already chipped it twice because I'm such a big brain. But these dudes, whoever they are, had a lot of money. Reading the stones. 
On the face of it, the messages on the guide stone seem pretty straightforward, and the sponsor group declared that people should totally take them at face value and try not to read into them any more than what they said. However, there was so much speculation about what they might mean that the anonymous group, probably heaving a deep sigh, had to publish a list of explanatory precepts in order that their message for the future wasn't twisted or misinterpreted in any way. We'll go into what these guidelines are supposed to mean in greater detail in a minute, but first I think we should talk about why these guide stones were created. The group behind the stones had fears for the future and wanted to ensure that should anything happen, there was a list of points on how to do it right next time. Depending on how far you're talking into the future, though, I always want to just come back to the idea of the world court, right? Or any of those precepts, really. It's just there's so much of a problem with this. You're talking about a time where there's obviously been some major disaster because there were, what, like 8 billion people in the world? 7 billion? 8 billion? I don't know. There's billions of people in the world today. And there's going to be 500 million, and that's where you should cap it out. So obviously there's been some world-ending disaster. And they're even talking about this could be like a future society, which is going to have a different language and all this stuff. I mean, translate it into all the different old languages you want and whatever. What's a court? Who's going to know what a court is? Like, it'd be like, I wonder what this court thing was. <laughs> no one knows. No one could possibly know. It could be like, nations? What are nations? <laughs> we all live in peaceful harmony. <laughs> According to R.C. Christie, the stones and messages have been 20 years in the planning, meaning that worries about future world wars and nuclear annihilation were probably the motives that kick-started the idea for the monuments. Good, we don't have to worry about those anymore. <laughs> At all. Oh my. Uh, it's. I am so like, it's so sad that at some point there's going to be, just because time is, you know, it goes on forever, basically. At some point, there's going to be some other major war that's going to kill billions or hundreds of millions of people. And the whole of the world is going to get all screwed up and all sort of old stuff's going to get destroyed. And there's going to be like more genocides. I mean, not that genocides aren't going on, but there's going to be like some other turbo genocide. And it's going to be like, it's just a bit depressing. And I like the fact that I'm like 30 something years old. And I like the fact that my parents are like 60 something years old and we haven't lived through any, I mean, there's been wars and stuff, but we haven't lived through anything crazy. Like my grandparents and stuff, they were like born at the tail end of, tail end? I don't know, how old are my grandparents? Like They're like 90s. So yeah, I mean, they lived through some war -y shit. Like I remember my nan talking about rationing and stuff. And it's just like, yeah, I'm glad they had to live through that and not us. And I hope that my children and my children's children don't have to. But the reality is that at some point, little like grandchildren whistlers, that's my name if you didn't know it, were uh, are, like going to have to go off and find some sort of war and probably die. And I'm like, that's really depressing because I like my kids. And I don't want their kids or kids' kids to have to do that because it will be sad. Well, this has been a tangent. Obviously, war is depressing. Fact boy, just carry on with the story. The group was worried about a nuclear event so large that civilization would have to be rebuilt from the ground up, and nuclear war definitely fits into that category. Another reason for the stone's placement in Alberton was that it was off the beaten track and likely to survive a missile strike due to being pretty much in the middle of nowhere. All that granite under the ground would also make it a more stable place to build a long-lasting monument in case of a natural disaster. So this group of like-minded and presumably rich Americans decided to bestow their wisdom upon the poor people who were left scrambling to rebuild society after the world ended. So, let's get back to those messages and the explanations given for them. Some of them are very specific and others are a bit more vague, so it seems likely that some or all of them were written by different people. Yeah, it does feel pretty disjointed, so it feels like, you know, everyone chipped in a bit and got to come up with a rule. Now, if you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. Maybe everyone in the group got to have their own guideline passed down forever, and that's why they seem a bit inconsistent. I agree, Katie, there we go, same page. Here are the guidelines again, followed by their explanatory precepts. Number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. And then the explanatory quote was, means the entire human race at its climax level for permanent balance with nature. Wait, the explanatory note means less than the actual thing on the stone, which I guess is good. Okay, here we go. We all know that the planet is groaning under the weight of humans, and we're really cocking up the place as far as living with nature goes. But 500 million people? Even in 1980, the population was nudging 4.5 billion. It's so crazy that we've basically doubled that since 1980. I know it's only going to get faster and faster, but it's so crazy. And also, I feel like, I, I know, I, I even live in a city. But I'm like, it doesn't feel very crowded. And then you go out into the countryside and you're like, there's no one here. This is really nice. And I live in a fairly, you know, not super densely packed country. But then, I mean, then you go to somewhere like truly uninhabited. Like, I don't know, a friend of mine's from Montana. 
and I, I live in Prague in the Czech Republic and coming from the UK I'm like quite it's pretty sparsely populated here you go out into the countryside and there's just no one there and then my friend from Montana who lives here as well he's like my dude what are you talking about it's so crowded here all the time and I'm like grant mate yeah I know but you, you he's told stories where it's like yeah it was like three hours drive and I didn't see another car I'm like what is going on in Montana why does no one live there uh what are we talking about Okay, so it's 1980, the population's four and a half billion, so RC Christian's group is expecting a hell of a cull. According to worldometers.info, interesting website name, the world population hasn't been as low as 500 million since the 1600s, so who knows why they decided on that number. I don't know, the 1600s were great. Wasn't that when there was that big plague? <laughs> While there is no denying that a mass extinction event of humans would be great for the planet, uh, <laughs> holy sh**, this guideline seems a bit strict. And really, who's going to be checking on how many people there are when 95% of the human race has been snuffed out? What happens if the population accidentally pops over the line? Well, obviously, you've got to kill them. <laughs> Is there going to be an annual call <laughs> when taken with subsequent messages on the stones? This piece of advice starts to take on a darker tone. Oh god, where are we going? Guideline number two. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Explanatory note. Without going into details as yet undiscovered, this means humanity should apply reason and knowledge to guiding its own reproduction. Fitness could be translated as health. Diversity could be translated as variety. Mate. This is just sounding straight like eugenics, right? Like uh, selective breeding of humans. Well, thanks for the lesson on how to use the thesaurus, anonymous American person, and way to dodge a bullet by adding diversity to the guideline. Although the explanation sort of narrows this down with the word variety. Diversity implies to broaden the genetic pool as much as possible by reproducing with other races. Variety, to my mind, means, for example, different hair color within the same racial group. Yeah, I guess. I guess, yeah, divert. I mean, diversity seems like a more clear word other than variety, which is generally not applied when talking about this stuff. It seems a, it's all very weird, isn't it? Also, if humanity's taken such a hit that it's been reduced to practically nothing, it's probably pretty slim pickings out there for who you might want to start re repopulating the planet with. Yes, we seem to be edging around the murky world of eugenics here, and it definitely bears pointing out that during the inception of this granite monument, forced sterilizations of people deemed mentally unfit were being carried out all over the United States, and minorities such as Native Americans were still being sterilized against their will into the 1970s. Which is insane, America. And not just America, let's just go with humanity in general. What the f*** are you up to? And this guideline, and that, I mean, I don't want to make any excuses for, for eugenics, because obviously it's wrong. But uh, doing it based on race is insane. Like, I'm not going to make the argument for, because I find it morally pretty horrible, but you can see a reason for weeding out genetic diseases you can see the logic behind that someone could and but just doing it on race is just insane it's like there's no logic there <laughs> it's just racism <laughs> And this, and this guideline was written after the Second World War and all that Hitler's obsession with a master race entailed, so it's hard to take anything like this as an innocent statement. I don't really care what the guideline says or even what the explanation means. There is no way that this isn't a very loaded message. Yeah, I can see why these people wanted to remain anonymous, because it's like, yeah, yeah, what are you into? Yeah, 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 well, I've got, you know, everyone's contributing their lines to the story. It's like one guy's like, well, I think that nations should resolve all their differences with the world court. And the other guy's like, yeehaw! <laughs> I want my want to be about eugenics and racism. <laughs> oh no. It seems that you should only reproduce to give birth to increasingly superior specimens and not for any other reason, like, I don't know, wanting to have children with a partner you love. Man, the future sounds bleak. Number three, unite humanity with a living new language. Uh, okay, I hope they clarify like what a living language is, because aren't all languages living? It's not like, yeah, yeah, Latin. Okay, great. So let's not do Latin or any of the other dead languages. Let's use a language that can evolve, which language does all the time. Oh, okay. Well, they are explaining it. This is the explanation. A living language grows and changes with advancing knowledge. A new language will be developed de novo and need not necessarily be adapted from any languages now in existence. Ah, uh, these people sound like uh, the, the person who wants you to think that they're smarter than they actually are. But then someone reasoning goes, that's a bit stupid, isn't it? 
Phew, at least this one is a little less contentious. Okay, so we got a bunch of people living all over the place, speaking different languages. What is one to do? Well, refer to the guidelines and just make up a whole new language that somehow everyone will be able to learn. It sounds hard, it does. And it's been tried before with Esperanto, I know about that language, and it never really took off. It. If I, I think if humanity's down to the bare bones, people are just gonna stay where they are and continue using the language of the people that they now live with. Yeah, it's like, oh my God, the world's been destroyed destroyed by nuclear war fortunately we've got these guide stones to guide us to a better thing and they say that we should be learning a new language so we'll be like yo 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 peter how about we just speak english because there's other shit we have to worry about like you know radiation and food and shelter and basic survival peter's like no the guidelines say new language jeff i always like to give my people character names like peter and jeff and john if a stranger turns up, what usually happens? They learn the language of the people they now live with, and it's not like languages will be wiped off the map. I'm sure there'll be some people left with knowledge of more than one, and we have Google Translate. But I suppose it would make sense for everyone that left to be able to communicate, so a new language seems smart. How it be started, though, and how to work at all the grammar, etc., well, I'll leave that to the future survivor people. Emojis, anyone? Yeah, I mean, this is, the po this is such a pointless entry on there. Rule 3 is stupid. Number 4. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Okay, I mean super generic. And the uh, explanation. Faith here may be used in a religious sense. Too often people are ruled by blind faith even when it may be contrary to reason. Yeah, okay. Reason must be tempered with compassion here, but must prevail. Okay, so just be reasonable. So everyone just has to calm down and be reasonable. I don't really have a problem with this one, although some people's interpretation of what they think is reasonable is going to be the exact opposite of other people's. This particular guideline with its emphasis on reason is one of the central tenets of this group's beliefs, which we'll get into in more detail later on. That was a very short one. I think it's because, yeah, of course, rule with, rule with reason. Okay, great. Moving on, number five. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Courts must consider justice as well as the law. I mean, that's what courts do now. It's like, yeah, okay, the law's there, and it's interpreted by the courts. Isn't that what justice, isn't that what the, the law is? It's like you go there and you make an argument, and then if the law seems dumb, either, I don't know, I know it for the UK, Parliament will be like, yeah, 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 we're changing this stupid law. Or the courts will interpret it in a way that basically changes it. It's, you know, okay, well, this previous case that we should go on, if it's from a higher court or the same court or whatever, says this. But, like, we're going to just, you know interpret it a little bit differently so that justice prevails because that's fair doesn't that explanation make it sound like the courts can just do whatever they want i mean yeah and to a large extent courts do find ways often to do what they want and it usually is fair because courts are generally fair i think people who have been wrong generally want justice over and above any everything else so it sounds like courts in the future will have carte blanche to dole out whatever punishments they want regardless of the law it also seems uh, i don't know casey i think this is open to interpretation which i mean when you're making rules for a future society i guess is something you probably don't want but uh you've definitely allowed it also seems that in the future post-apocalyptic world nations have remained and are going to get into arguments with other nations yay and also hang on who is going to be protecting these nations and overseeing how fair these laws are an uber nation or a un type entity how many people do you need in the world to have this sort of global system and sure who doesn't want fair laws and just courts on paper on granite that seems like a good idea in practice though who knows what people will come up with yeah i mean this is one of the things it's not like you can just write like this is how it's going to be the legal system has evolved over a very very long time to be the kind of shoddy thing that it is today which i mean i just said like yeah generally people get justice and like <laughs> you joking whistle boy <laughs> it's a bit of a joke i mean the justice system is like i mean I, I it's the best thing we've got but innocent people go to prison or get punished all the time and guilty people get off even more often it's definitely not perfect in any way whatsoever I don't think we should be dictating to a future society how to do things when we haven't got it right ourselves. Number six, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in the world court. And the explanation is, individual nations must be free to develop their own destinies at home as their own people wish, but cannot abuse their neighbors. Hang on, mate, but aren't you just making these granite stones telling everyone what to do? What are you up to? Wait, wait, wait. I thought the immediate concern after an apocalyptic event would be to get the place up and running again. Would all the tiny amount of people want to stay within the limits of their own pre-existing nations? No, we talked about this when the zombie apocalypse, you listen to the ham radio, 
and you're like there's you you listen for signals people who've set up some camp somewhere and they've got a big wall and they've got guns and food and fresh water and the zombies are at the gate and eventually they get over the gate and they're over on the camp and a band of survivors will escape i don't even know what i'm pulling this from but i'm guessing it's like every zombie movie ever or post-apocalyptic movie would countries even really exist anymore? Surely some populations would be almost totally annihilated, but the survivors have got to keep it all local whilst also learning a new global language at the same time. Not, don't forget, setting up a brand new legal system. And depending on what resources the countries have remaining to them, you know that some of them are going to develop way more quickly than others. Seems a bit unfair given the state the world has found itself in in this imagined future. I mean, can't we all just get along? Yes, would be nice. Probably not going to happen, though. Number seven, avoid petty laws and useless officials. And the explanation is self-explanatory. Ah, yes. And we'll probably succeed at that at the beginning. But then let me introduce you to the wonderful world of inevitable bureaucracy. Haha, <laughs> the explanation says it all. I bet this person had a specific useless official in mind when they submitted this guideline. Yes, oh my God. Useless officials. Useless people. Oh my God, what was it the other day? It's like, yeah, there's this bizarre thing. I don't know how it is in other countries, but when buying property here, you uh, you buy the property, you know, you, you make an offer, it gets accepted, blah, 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 blah. And at some point you apply for a mortgage and a person from the bank comes and values the property. And this is not just like some guy who has some other job. It's like the official job is like property valuer. And you're like, well, that makes a lot of sense because the bank needs to secure the thing. In all of all the properties that I've, I mean, <laughs> I'm some property mogul, but like, you know when i've there's properties that i've wanted and have fallen through and all this stuff I had a few valued and it's like every single time it's always come back as about 10 percent less than the price i'm buying it for and i was curious about this and i talked to other people i talked to like the guy who got me the mortgage and he's like yeah it's just how it works it's just they go in and they value it at 10 percent less so the bank get, you know so the bank has some like protection or whatever i don't really understand it but it's always 10 percent less they always just find a way to make it 10 percent less and i'm like so this guy's job is entirely pointless and I'm like yeah yeah i mean but he values it and i'm like yeah but he's not is he? he's just like finding a way to push it towards that price and then check in a box and this is just one example of many bureaucrats that exist <laughs> i can just imagine the guy who came up with this one the self-explanatory is that yeah he wanted to he wanted a permit to put a pool in in his backyard and they wouldn't give it to him for some stupid ass reason and he's like i'm a goddamn person at city hall i'm making this rule just for you Everybody hopes to avoid useless officials, so at least that's something to look forward to in the desolate, blasted future world. Number eight, balance personal rights with social duties. I mean, obviously. Interestingly, something that we're dealing with right now. It's like, yo, young people, like myself, obviously, I mean, not obviously, but statistically, it seems like my risk of COVID basically fairly fairly minimal because i'm a healthy relatively young man risk of covid jab also extremely minimal because i'm a healthy young man but they're also kind of like about the same risk so it's like why would i intentionally get a vaccine and it's like well because i'm not a piece of and i want to do my part for society that i live in so that i don't get sick and then pass it all on to some old person that i kill but mostly because i'm not a piece of shit. go get a vaccine <laughs> Oh my god, some people are going to be smashing that dislike button being like, Simon, I'm a sovereign citizen. Wait, hang on, hang on. Let me put on my, my appropriate voice this. Simon, I'm a sovereign citizen and I will do as I please with my body as given to me by Jesus. So, okay, chill out. Okay, chill out. Do your thing. Do your bit for humanity. All right, Simon, get off your soapbox. Be a good post-apocalypse citizen, okay? I'm a bit confused over why the guidelines want to push people to work for a greater good, yet still remain insular and within their own nations. Yeah, probably because different people wrote each guideline. <laughs> I don't really know whether the ethos of the sponsor group or the individuals within it are making different their are making their differing beliefs shown. Whatever the case, there's no denying that pulling together after a crisis is preferable to going it alone, especially if you're like me, where well, my best chance of survival would be definitely dependent on being in a larger group. <laughs> yeah, Katie's writing this, but I'm also like, preach. It's like in a zombie apocalypse. I I'm, I, I don't I kid myself at all. I'm definitely going to be one of the first people to go. <laughs> it's like, one, I live in a city. Two, I don't have any means of defending myself because I don't have any, like, fighting skills. I don't own a gun. I do own, I do know how to use a gun. Um, so I guess I'd have to get a gun. <laughs> but it's like, nah, I'm not, I'm not joking. I'd be, I'd be like, I'd be finding a group ASAP who has guns and then hopefully giving me one. and uh, Or hopefully not, just protecting me. <laughs> I'll be like, what What skills do you have, Simon? What do you bring to the group? It's like, I can 
I, I got a good knowledge of some facts. <laughs> we could, there's no electricity. We could sit down in the evening. I could read you a script. Ah, oh, please don't leave me. Preferably with people who can cook. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not a brilliant cook either. I can cook, but I'm not a brilliant cook. Number nine, prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. <sighs> Whoever wrote this is a hippie who somehow got rich. The infinite here means the supreme being, the explanation, sorry. The infinite here means the supreme being whose will is manifest in the workings of the cosmos. Goddamn hippie! Whoa! Dude! Get out of here! Not cool! If we will seek for it. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> Who let this guy in the rich people group? How did you get rich, hippies? I, I won the lotto. Oh, God, get out. Come on, but we need your money, lotto guy. Okay, who lets hippie Charlie have a guideline? <laughs> I don't read these ads. Seriously, as well as learning a new language and keeping all of their emotions in check, future people are supposed to also be going on a spiritual journey. Doesn't this get? Doesn't this contradict guideline four about ruling everything with tempered reason? And don't let me... And don't tell me to prize truth, beauty, and love, you patronizing old git. I'll do that on my own. Thank you very much. Preach, Katie. This one sounds more like something that you'd see on a fridge magnet than a line of advice for the ages. Yeah, or a shitty t-shirt, or like some platitude that again, someone who thinks they're smart but isn't says. Number 10. Be not a cancer of the earth. Leave room for nature leave room for nature did they really need to repeat i i just assume maybe it was a mistake earlier but no they really appear to have written leave room for nature twice dude you're literally carving into granite it's like i mean it's good whoever's carving that's gonna be like really my dude <laughs> did we need to do that did we really come on uh the explanation is in our time the growth of humanity is destroying the natural conditions of the earth which have fostered all existing life we must restore reasoned balance well i mean yeah I, I know it's bad and stuff like I mean humanity we're really we're really screwing up the planet I saw something the other day it was about Europe and it was like there was just I can't remember the figures or anything but it was about num amounts of CO2 that we need to be consuming to you know sustain the earth and not fuck it up more than we already have and it was like this tiny little slither and then it was like actual consumption of uh, CO2 by people in Europe and it was massively like it was just huge and I was just like, oh my god, we're fucked. <laughs> we're so, we're so, so screwed. What I want to do, and I kind of feel bad for not having done it yet, is join one of those uh, things where you carbon offset your life. Because, I don't know, I'm not probably going to buy, like, I, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll get an electric car, but right now the parking bay that I have, it doesn't have a charger, so it's like, all right, well, I can't really charge an electric car, can I? And now I don't drive a hybrid. <laughs> um, but I realized that I probably should, and then there's all this other stuff I do, like I fly around the place. I mean, I did before COVID and I don't know, I'd lead like a relative. I eat lots of meat. I love steak. And I realize, OK, I'm probably quite a carbon heavy person. And I was like, I'd love to sign up. It's like, it's, I don't know, it's not even expensive. Like I put my lifestyle into one of these estimate your carbon footprint things and the cost of off offsetting. And I think it was like 30 bucks a month. Maybe it's a little bit more than that, but it wasn't that much. And I'm like, that's something I really should do. And I haven't done it yet, but I will. Because, honestly, just offsetting is easier than reducing my carbon emissions because I love steak. And I like driving a car. And uh, I like flying places. And I will happily pay more to be able to do those things. And is it really that simple? That seems like way too an easier easier of a solution. What are we talking about? I'm sorry. I'm just totally on a on a tangent. There's that word again, reason. There are references to it all over the guidestones. The inscription on the capstone is, uh, let these be guidestones to an age of reason. And the sponsors are described as a small group of Americans who seek the age of reason. Oh, what I was going to say, I'm sorry. The reason I went on that whole tangent and then I totally forgot what my whole point was. It's like, yeah, 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 we're really screwing up the environment now. But by the time these guidestones come into place from like some nuclear apocalypse or anything, everyone's going to be like, uh, <laughs> and we are worried about carbon dioxide. <laughs> now the whole world's irradiated. Brilliant. I had welcome carbon dioxide back into my life. But what does it mean? The reason thing, what does it mean? It seems that this group has a bee in its bonnet about human overpopulation, but reasonable people would not demand rigid population control to combat that. That's what unreasonable people would do. It's also not clear. I. Am I an unreasonable. <laughs> Casey and I, maybe not. I haven't thought out this opinion very much at all. But it does seem that a. 
okay, let's not call it reasonable immediately. Let's say a method of, you know, reducing carbon emissions is population control, because obviously the most carbon heavy event that you can something just definitely fell over in my office there's no one else here <laughs> like what is that terrifying sound <laughs> i make another show called casual criminalist and whenever i hear like it's always something really super scary and when there's a knock somewhere in my office i'm like oh god today's the day that i get murdered on camera isn't it um stop going on these tangents get back to the get back to the facts i even forgot what i was talking about oh my god this is such a train wreck i'm so sorry <laughs> oh yeah, well, uh, there, that, that's it. I was talking about, um, is population control a reasonable way to control, like, climate change? And I mean, yeah, kinda, is. I mean, we should all be better with our carbon thing, but the, the best thing you can do is not have, like, seven kids. Because, you know, they're all gonna use a lot of, they're all gonna make a lot of carbon dioxide. It's also not clear why leave room for nature is repeated. And I'm not saying we should kill ever anyone, by the way. I'm just saying maybe we should have less kids. Is it to underline the importance of the message, or did the stonemason accidentally keep chipping away, so ended up doing the whole sentence again? This one more or less says the same thing as guidelines one and nine, but it's delivered in a bit in a more biblical Ten Commandments way than either of the other two. Uh, nature also seems to be important to the group, so but maybe they could have stuck with one guideline about overpopulation versus nature, and then use the other one to give future people some more useful advice, like a foolproof bread recipe or how to diversify your portfolio. <laughs> And I'm not altogether sure why they thought these were really worth preserving in the first place, as most of them are just common sense and the way many people live their lives anyway. I don't know about that again. Do we really live our lives in like harmony with nature? I really feel I, I really I feel like such a bad person sometimes with all this stuff. It's like why you go to the you know I get food delivered, like just supermarket food, and it's bags within bags within plastic. Like you're fi you know it's like oh, okay so there's a chocolate bar. And the chocolate bar is in a wrapper, which is in, you know, it's a multi-pack, so then it's in another wrapper. And then it's in a bag, but because the bag was heavy, the supermarket's double-bagged it. And it's been driven there by a man in his car. And you're like, oh my god, what am I doing to the environment? I'm a piece of shit. I'm so sorry, environment. The Sponsors Judging by what little we know about the group who sponsored the Georgia Guidestones, we can make a few deductions. Okay, assumptions. They were all American. This is stated on the explanatory tablet. At least some of them were very wealthy. The group was quoted a silly amount to get the monument built, and they accepted the price without haggling. Maybe this also means R.C. Christian in particular was a bit dim or trusting. Let's go with trusting or, alternatively, just so rich he doesn't care. You know, he's just there like, this is the price. And they're like, okay, I guess so. It's like that thing where it was was it on Ellen or something where Bill Gates he the people ask him how much it costs. Like it's just like, what is the price of a banana? Mmm, five dollars. <laughs> and Ellen's like, 32 cents or whatever. It's like just his guesses are so wildly wrong. And I mean I totally get it. I mean, I'm not even sure how much a banana costs, and I'm not like Bill Gates. I think you just I I don't know, you just click on bananas. You know they're cheap. I guess. I mean, I don't know, that doesn't feel that out of touch. Bananas are cheap. You could just buy a bunch of bananas. Like, I'll still be in the supermarket and be like, oh, well, let's not buy that because that's super expensive. But for fruit, unless it's some exotic fruit, I know it's going to be affordable because super cheap. The overall impressions given by the messages in the Enterprise in general smacks of a group of wealthy white American men generously bestowing their largesse on the world in the form of their ten wise commandments. I'm more than happy to be proved wrong on this point, but come on, you know it's true. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree with you, Katie. The only real lead we have to identify the group is the pseudonymous. Ask a pseudonymous? Pseudonymous. Pseudonymous. That's a weird word. R.C. Christian. As pseudonyms go, it's pretty on the nose. R.C. Christian. Either it was an obvious allusion to his religious beliefs or the total opposite and was ironically used by an atheist or, shock horror, a Satanist. I feel this is quite an atheistic thing, so I would guess it's more in irony. Like, uh, they've done the, ten the name, I mean, and then they've done their Ten Commandments, and it's like, okay. <laughs> chill out. Onlookers at the unveiling were swift to decry the guidestones as satanic, but I'm not really sure why. Yeah, they don't really have any bad messages. They're all like, I mean, they're, they're like I say, they're cliche, but they're not bad messages. Maybe they thought they were blasphemous alternatives to the Ten Commandments, or that the astrological aspects inherent in the monument meant that it was automatically a cult somehow. Wait, just because of, wait, astrological? 
astronomical. Ast- There's nothing astrological about this. Is that astrology is the one about like? Because I remember I was a kid, and I love. I've I've always loved science. And I remember like in the in the news agents there was this magazine. It was called Astrology Monthly. And I was like, sweet. I'm definitely gonna buy that. And then I get by this magazine and I take it home, and I'm like really disappointed to find out that it's about like I don't know some wizard. Shit. And I'm like, oh for f**k's sake. And that was the moment that you know <laughs> that I discovered astrology and that whole piece of. Shit. But I don't know why they'd be thinking the astronomy aspects would make this a cult somehow. While it might make you think of Stonehenge in that it's made up of large stones with a capstone on top, that's about as far as the similarities go, as everyone knows how this baby was assembled. It's also not as accurate celestial body-wise as Stonehenge, but this wasn't really the group's chief concern. The original sponsor group did hope that another group in the future might add an additional circle around their original cluster, but so far, nobody has appeared to find this necessary. Uh, I think it's about time we got that sorted. Let's get a GoFundMe going. Expand the Georgia Guidestones. And uh, I'd make them, I'd just make it sarcastic and put like recipes for bread and shit in there because that'd be fun. It's been speculated that R.C. Christian is a thinly veiled reference to the Rosicrucians, a movement that sprang, sprang up in the 1600s and whose manifesto referred to a universal reformation of mankind, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. The central feature of Rosicrucianism, oh my god, the big boy words in this in this script are complicated, is the belief that its members possess secret wisdom that was handed down to them from ancient times. <laughs> okay, sounds like a conspiracy theory. All this does sound quite familiar, and from above, the guidestones even kind of resemble the Rose Cross, so maybe these 20th century members thought they should quickly pass on their secret knowledge before humanity accidentally destroyed itself. A lot of big names from the past have been linked to the Rosicrucian movement, including Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and Thomas Paine. Paine has been widely credited with helping to inspire American revolutionaries, particularly with his pamphlet entitled Common Sense. In, ni- in 1794, he released part one of a pamphlet called The Age of Reason. This does cover a lot of the grounds that the Guidestones espouse and comes under the umbrella of deism, which is, according to Dictionary.com, an intellectual movement of the 17th and 18th centuries that accepted the existence of a creator on the basis of reason, but rejected the belief in a supernatural deity who interacts with humankind. I actually quite like that. I think that's quite sensible. I mean, I don't really believe in the existence of a creator. Actually, no, scratch that. I don't believe in this at all. Rosicrucianism, if I am pronouncing that correctly, pulled ideas from all over the place, including occultism and Christian Gnosticism. Oh my god. (laughs) This, This script is making me feel stupid. And some scholars are not even sure that it really existed at all or if it was some sort of hoax. The movement does exist today, though with the Rosicrucian Fellowship coming with the tagline, an association of Christian mystics. So maybe this is where old R.C. and his group were coming from. Another sponsor of the Guidestones, or maybe R.C. Christian himself, has long been thought to be Ted Turner. Turner was an American billionaire, media tycoon, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. A brief look at his CV is quite telling. As well as many other things, Turner is the chairman of the United Nations Foundation and the co-chairman and founder of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. He also created a foundation in his own name to address issues about population growth and prior to launching CNN. In 1980, I was like, I feel like I know the name Ted Turner. Why do I know the name Ted Turner? Because he started CNN. He created a so-called doomsday video of military bands performing Nearer My God to Thee to be broadcast whenever the end of the world came. (laughs) Oh my. Ted Turner. A little bit pessimistic there, mate. He also grew up in Georgia and is a big nature lover, so it does seem to be so it does seem to be a good call, but the anonymity clause has held since 1979, so I don't think anyone's about to break it now. The appointed go-between Wyatt Martin said in 2013, They could put a gun to my head and kill me. I will never reveal his real name. So I guess that's one mystery that will forever remain unsolved. Good news. Good news. It's not a particularly important one. <laughs> Other theories. While the messages were seemingly written in good faith and were meant to be taken literally, conspiracy theories of course still sprung up. The stones have been vandalized many times over the years, with graffiti saying things like, Death to the New World Order in 2009, and I am Isis, goddess of love. I guess that's some sort of goddess rather than Islamic State. <laughs> in 2014, 
Uh, that was, sorry, in 2014. Bits have been chipped off, and also in 2014, somebody replaced a chipped off bit with a new cube with mysterious letters and numbers engraved onto it. People went wild with numerology theories and references to what it might mean until the man responsible spoke up, saying that it has carved his and his wife's initials and their anniversary of their wedding date into it. <laughs> Uh, I love this. I love it. That's how so many conspiracies end. It's like, oh my god, this is a big mean. It's like, nah, it's nothing. It's really nothing. It's nothing at all. They had actually been married at the Guidestones the year before. The biggest conspiracy theories relate to the problematic population cap guideline, with this being interpreted as an imminent call to cull humanity and establish a new world order rather than some advice for what to do in the aftermath of a disaster. <laughs> and what of the occult nature? Of the Guidestones, religious figures in the community had always warned of satanic practices and blood sacrifices that would be carried out at the site, but maybe they just gave people the idea to do it. Shadowy groups such as the Illuminati have also apparently performed rituals at the Guidestones, but there is no real evidence that any human or animal sacrifices have been made there. There was aerial, even if there was, it's just people like having a bit of a laugh. I mean, human sacrifice and animal sacrifice obviously not a bit of a laugh but it's not people who it, it's got nothing to do with it it's just stupidity there was aerial footage of what looked like a big blood stain on the capstone in 2015 but people at the scene said that the video had been photoshopped and there wasn't really anything on the capstone apart from maybe some water residue and it's not like the guidestones are sitting on a particularly spiritual or holy spot or have any reference to rituals or religious practices on them they were put up in 1980, the year of the Empire Strikes Back and shoulder pads, so it's not exactly a venerated historical site yet. And I don't think it ever will be. It's kind of stupid, and the messages are stupid. And I mean, not stupid, just cliched. The languages chosen for the messages to be inscribed onto the granite slabs were deemed the most likely to be understood at the time, although this begs the question as to why there was stuff written in Babylonian cuneiform around the capstone. One sentence in any language isn't enough to extrapolate a whole alphabet, so maybe they were just showing off. And while there are eight living languages represented as well as four dead ones, the explanatory key is all in English. Imagine if you made it to the stones, didn't recognize the English name for your language on the explanation tablet, and collapsed in a sobbing heap on the ground. Maybe the hope for humanity would give up before they started. Or maybe the whole monument was supposed to be a time capsule for future people or alien races to discover. I think, yeah, it's definitely designed for future post-apocalyptic people. I mean, it's definitely not designed for people in the past. That would be weird. If so, maybe they should have made a bit more of a song and dance about it, as I think that less than 1% of the population alive today have even heard of the Georgia Guidestones, let alone what all their extremely important tenants are. So, anyway, if you find yourself on the other side of an apocalypse and need to work out how to rebuild society according to a group of wealthy white men from 1970s North America, <laughs> where else would you go for information? Uh, sarcasm, everybody. Now you know where to find the answers. Good luck, future humans. Good luck. Yes, and that is the end of today's episode of Decoding the Unknown. <laughs> I really, there wasn't really much to decode on this one, was there? It's kind of like the Georgia Guidestones. A bit shit, really. Uh, that's, uh, that's, I mean, the mystery, of course, is who made them. But also, also, who cares? This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Thank you so much for listening or watching, depending on how you get this show. If you are listening to my voice through a podcast app of some kind, Go in there, see if you can do reviews, and then just gently tap that five-star button and write something along the lines of, Simon, you legends, I've never discovered a podcast better in my entire life up until this point, and this show is what I now live for. That would be fantastic and honest. It would be honest of you. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you next time. 